Now, if you remember, we saw verse 2, <clears throat> chapter 4, verse 2, continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. So Paul there challenged us to, challenge the believers to pray steadfastly, to watch for the tempter, and to thank God for his grace. And today we're going to be looking at verses 3 and 4. <clears throat> with all, praying also for us, that God would open unto us a door of utterance, to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bonds, that I may make it manifest as I got to speak. <clears throat> Let's have a look at the word of prayer. Dear Father, very short passage this afternoon, but so full, if we dig deep into what Paul is saying. We read back in uh, Matthew chapter 6 where the disciples <clears throat> called upon you and said, Lord, teach us to pray. And 2,000 years later, here we are trying to learn how to communicate with you better. We need to learn how to pray. And Paul gives us some very interesting clues in what we need to uh, explore today. And I pray, Lord, that your spirit will help me as I open up this passage, these two verses. Uh, it's some, there's something here for each one of us, especially as we look to next week, uh, Friday and Saturday, Lord, as we, we connect all together, Lord, in this prayer chain. Uh, we might uh, be into that hour of prayer, maybe 20, 30 minutes after we start, we, we just run out of things to pray for. And I think uh, this message might help us, Lord, to pray more effectively. Not just for one hour, but uh, without looking at the watch, Father, without looking at time, uh, that we might enjoy a time of fellowship and communion with you. So, Lord, help us this afternoon. I pray that your Spirit will work not only uh, through the messenger, but also in those who receive it. May all of us understand how we need to pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm. Remember last week we looked at chapter 4 verse 2, the Holy Spirit had Paul challenge the Colossian believers to pray steadfastly, to watch uh, for the tempter, because he's always around trying to get us, trying to trick us into <coughs> falling, and then always have thanksgiving in our lips, uh, thanking God for his grace. This afternoon I would like to talk to you about, I'd like to preach about praying for others. Praying for others. We normally meet on Wednesday, and uh, the prayer requests, uh, it's interesting that they normally uh, circle around health, health issues. Pray for this individual who's sick, who's going through this uh, illness. Pray for my auntie, pray for my mother, pray for my neighbor, and so on. And many times we, 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 we don't think um, in, in biblical terms of what, what we should pray. And I think verses 3 and 4 this afternoon will give us, at least show us three duties relate, uh, relating to praying for others that, I, uh, that I'd like to share with you. I see three points as usual in, the, in this passage. One is praying unselfishly. Praying unselfishly. What do you say, what, what do you mean, Pastor? Well, showing unselfish concern for the welfare of others. Um, and really be interested in what others are going through. And so it's, it's important that we pray for ourselves. But this afternoon we'll see how Paul says, don't forget me. I'm going through some situations. Have some empathy. Understand what I'm going through. So we will look at that in a few minutes. So pray unselfishly, then pray empathically, emp empathetically, empathicamente, <laughs> if you allow me, with empathy, that is entering understanding and entering into another person's feelings. How do they feel about this? When we think about the missionaries, I think it's important that we empathize with what they're going through. When we pray, pray for others, how the, what, we put ourselves in their, in their shoes. And Paul is calling the believers to say, hey, put yourself in my shoes. See what I'm going through. I need your help. I'll be entering into a spiritual battle, and I need your prayers. I need boldness, I need open doors, and I need um, an open mouth that might speak the truth. I 
And then, you know, I might be able to say the proper thing to reveal the mystery of the gospel. And then we need to pray evangelistically, evangelistically, with a burden for the spread of the gospel. <clears throat> and again, Paul uh, here, and in like, two other places, I believe, in the New Testament, he prays for open doors. He prays for open doors, for an open mouth, and for boldness. Pray evangelistically. So let's explore this a little bit. I think we can learn a lot from this. The first one would be pray unselfishly, that is showing unselfish concern for the welfare of others. And, you know, most, a lot of the times that we pray is me, myself, and I, I have this need, and we, we're very concerned about others being praying for us. And it's not, it's not, it's not wrong. It is right to pray for yourself. In fact, in verse 2 again, it says, I continue in prayer, <clears throat> that is for yourselves. And that is in the context. Remember, when the uh, New Testament was written, it didn't have chapters and verses. It wasn't divided that way. So I think this has a connection with everything that Paul says uh, before that, with wives, husbands, children, fathers, servants, and then later on in chapter 4, verse 1, masters. You need to do these things, but you're not alone. Be in prayer. Continue in prayer. Make sure you have God's assistance in that in, in accomplishing that duty. So I think this is in a context. Be praying for yourself as these in order to make these things happen. So God has command for us to pray for ourselves. Yes, but uh, and it is right to pray and watch, as He says there in verse two, and at the same time be uh, thanking God. Uh, in our prayers for the things that are happening, even for tribulation. So as we uh, <clears throat> unpack these facts, we, we see several things. Notice in verse 3 again, it says, um, <clears throat> with all praying also for us. With all praying also, and that is, this word with all uh, would uh, would be trained, would, for us to be able to understand better is at the same time while you're praying don't forget to include us in your prayers so Paul commanded the Colossian believers to pray for God's grace for God's enabling to do the difficult duties that he's mentioned before and also to keep watch because the devil will try to trick us to not fulfill those things to not accomplish not live that way and he also Includes, don't forget, be thankful. Some of our prayers are just uh, don't mean to uh, offend anybody, but sometimes they sound more like a, a shopping list that we present before the Lord. We know what we want, and I think I've prayed like that before. As you grow old, you know, as you grow more in the Lord, you realize that it's not just presenting needs. But we need to thank the Lord. We need to be thankful. That's what motivated me to put that, that tree of thanksgiving. Right now it has about 15 little leaves. And I hope that as we end the year, we will have it blossom completely and be covered with leaves of thankfulness. It is important for us. And if you remember, Paul started this chapter with thanksgiving. He continued later on in chapter, through, chapter 3 saying, thank, be thankful all the time. And as he continues with prayer, says, don't forget to be thankful, whatever your situations might be. And, you know, if you look at the model that Paul presents in his prayer line, you, have you ever done that? Have you ever studied Paul's prayers? And it's an amazing thing. Tim once said, Tammy, you're not going to preach from chapter 1? And I said, I already did. He says, I wasn't aware of that. I did it some time ago. Maybe I might preach that message again just to help us remember. But chapter 1 is that this is fascinating prayer that Paul makes. And he's not praying, uh, take me out of prison, uh, help me with my health, and uh, by the way, I have needs, make sure you pray for them. No, he's concentrating even in prison for a spiritual understanding, for spiritual wisdom, for for the maturity of the saints, for them to be conformed to the image of Christ, that was his main concern. That was where most of his prayers were aimed to. Paul's prayers focused on 
hearts and mind being conformed to the image of Christ. In fact, if you want some examples, Paul regularly thanked God for many, for many saints, and you see this constantly in Romans chapter 1, verse 8 through 10, 1 Corinthians 1, 4, Ephesians 1, 6, Philippians 1, chapter, chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, Colossians 1, 3, 1 Thessalonians 1, 2, uh, and 3, 2 Thessalonians 1, 2 Timothy 1, Philippians it's all over the place. Have you ever noticed that? Every epistle that he opens up, he's thanking the Lord for others. He's thinking of others. But then he prayed for them to be filled with wisdom and spiritual understanding, for spiritual intelligence. That's how it's translated in Spanish. And you see that in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. He prayed that they would have hope, that they would lose that hope, that they would keep you know, pushing on no matter how hard the situation would be. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18, Romans 15, 13. He prayed that they would have peace, that they, they would, you know, peace will rule in their congregations. You see that in Romans 15, 5 and 6, 2 Thessalonians 3, 16. We also see Paul praying for strength, uh, uh, for their spirituality to be strengthened. Ephesians 3, 16, Colossians 1, 11. He prayed that they would grow in love. When was the last time you said, I have a very important request that we all here, every single one of us, will grow in love. You know, that's one of the things we hardly ever mention. But remember what the Lord said about his disciples. In this they will know you, that you are my disciples, that you love one another with sacrificial love. So Paul prayed for these things. Paul prayed for spiritual growth, not only spiritual strength, but spiritual growth in uh, Philippians chapter 1, verse 9 through 11, Colossians 1 through 10, 2 Corinthians 13, 1 Thessalonians 5. He prayed for spiritual fruit to be produced in the lives of every believer. Uh, that would be, the spiritual would be the things that would glorify the Lord while we are living in this earth. And here we see that he's praying for opportunities to minister. Not just to the unbelievers, but here in 1 Thessalonians, Thessalonians 3, verse 9 and 10, opportunities to minister to others. Lord, please give me opportunities to minister, to be able to provide that which is lacking in my brethren. In one occasion, he said, I prefer to be with you. If you leave it to me, Lord, I'd rather be in heaven. But my brothers and sisters need this knowledge, and I would now choose to stay behind. But not just to kind of wiggle my thumbs in the cost of the soul, but to be ministering to them so that they will be transformed, transformed and they will experience spiritual transformation. And by the way, I mentioned a prayer in chapter 1 of Colossians, verses 9 through 12. Would you like to see it with me? It is a, in a very, very inspiring prayer. <clears throat> Paul receives news from Epaphras that, you know, the church there in Colossae was, had begun. And then there was brothers not only in Colossae, but also in uh, neighboring cities. And when he hears this news, notice the first thing he does in his prayer, what, he, what he's concerned about, uh, you know, uh, uh, what he wants these individuals, these new believers, to... Uh, acquire. He says, for this cause also, we also, since the day we heard, uh, heard it, do not cease to pray for you. We do not cease to pray for you. He's constantly bringing this before the Lord. Since the day we heard, we pray for you unceasingly, notice now, and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and, and spiritual understanding. And the Spanish translation is the spiritual intelligence. I like that word. That you might walk worthily. My interest in you, now that you have Christ, is that your walk, your behavior, is worthy of the Lord Jesus Christ you represent. That you might walk worthily of the Lord unto all pleasing, that you be pleasing to Him. Be fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God strengthened with all might according to the glorious power unto all patience and long-suffering in joyfulness. Giving thanks. You see it again? 
never he he never ends a prayer with just in Jesus' name, Amen. He says, "Oh, this is very important. I need to be thankful." <clears throat> I did a, a some a search on, on these po points that Paul is mentioning here, and uh, it's interesting. I really find it fascinating to see how Paul how what Paul in, uh, focused on when he prayed. He thanked God for one another, for the people that he met, for the people who were coming to Christ. In Romans 1, verse 8 through 10, he says, First, I thank God through Jesus Christ for all of you. In the southern language, it would be a thought for y'all, for y'all. And your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. I'm so thankful to the Lord that now you are sharing your faith with others. If you look at this point in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and 2, he says to the point that, you know, now that I'm going back through the, through the kind of walking back through the steps that I took some time ago, everywhere I go and try to share the gospel, people tell me, oh, we, we've already heard about that. We, we've heard that message before. And he goes on telling everybody as he's on his way to Thessalonica, and, says, and they said, oh, yeah, we know about that. Well, who did you hear from? Those guys over there in Thessalonica. They've been around here. And they share the gospel, and Paul is just, you know, just so joyful that they that to see this fruit in the, in the believers, even in the midst of tribulation. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 4, he says, I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ. Ephesians 1 16, I cease not to thank God. He says, I, I cease. I don't cease to thank God for you, making mention of you in my prayers. In Philippians chapter 1, verses 3 through 4, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Every time I, you come to mind, I, I, you know, I, I take the opportunity to pray for you. Well, this one catches my attention especially because when I was raising support for you in, in the United States, it came... I came to a church um, and um, I made my presentation. I said goodbye to the pastor and I asked him before I left, I said, would you please pray for us? We need your prayers. Obviously, we needed this financial support. But I said, you know, if we have this, I'm sure the Lord will take care of the rest. And he said, he says, and then usually he says, I'll pray for you as the Lord brings you to mind. I said, are you sure you're going to do that? I hope that you, we come to your mind often. Because we need your prayers. I've had another missionary who um, somehow bought a ton of coffee, coffee bags, and uh, every person he met, every Christian, he said, I'll give you this coffee bag if every time you make a, coffee, a cup of coffee, you pray for us. Very slick. Imagine every time you make a cup of coffee, you have committed to pray for that missionary. 10 or 20 cups of coffee coming out of that bag, you have 20 prayers. He was giving bags of coffee to everybody, thinking, well, hopefully this will help them remember me and will pray for us. In Colossians, again, chapter 1, verse 3, he says, We give thanks to God and the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, praying for you always. 1 Thessalonians 1, 2, we give thanks to God always for all, making mention of you in our prayers. Second Thessalonians 1, we are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet and as, as it is right. We are bound, we have this, we're committed to do this. We want to bring you before the Lord because we understand that you will be facing battles. Second Timothy 1, 3, thank God whom I serve for my forefathers with pure conscience that without ceasing, you, do, you see that in every sentence where he mentions prayer. Without ceasing, I have remembrance of thee in my prayers, night and day, greatly desire to see you. You would hear Paul saying, Lord, I want to go back there to uh, this church or that church. I want to go there, Lord. And would you please allow me to go back? And it wasn't taking up there. Air, um, Air France or Iberia or any of these airlines, you would have to walk there most of the time. Mm -hmm. Philippians chapter 1, I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers. We also see God prayed for wisdom 
and knowledge. When was the last time you prayed specifically for one person, one individual, and you said, Lord, he needs wisdom, he needs understanding. You know, as I come across some individuals who open their hearts to me and share, and share with me their burdens, I'm, I'm, I'm called to ask, to pray for the Lord, Lord, would you please give them understanding to do the right thing, to make the right choices. They need the knowledge, they don't, they don't know, they, they want to know, but it's a very puzzling situation, the decisions, decisions they have to make, they just, they want to do the right thing, but they don't know what direction to take. Lord, would you please give them understanding, would you give them spiritual intelligence, so that they can see. And we see that in Ephesians 1.17, that the God of, of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spiritual wisdom and a revelation in the knowledge of Him. We see that again in chapter 1, 9, and we're in Colossians. How about hope? How many times do you lose hope? You look at the news, boy, you know, it's a wonderful good way to lose your hope is just look at the news. You turn the news at 9 o'clock at Antena 3, and uh, five minutes later, you want to cut your veins. You, know, you just want to commit suicide. It's like, is there really any hope for this world? You see politicians going more and more, more corrupt. Countries are getting into trouble, the decisions that governments are taking just seem to always be in the wrong direction. And you see yourself in the middle of all this mess, and you say, well, maybe I'll sell my apartment in the Costa del Sol, move in land about 200 kilometers in the middle of nowhere, build myself a, a hut and live like a, a monk. Maybe that would be the answer. How many of you felt that way lately? I don't know about you, but you know, sometimes I think I was watching a documentary about this um, hermit. He wasn't really a hermit, he was a, a Mennonite living in the, yeah. uh, in the Appalachian Mountains. He didn't have electricity, he didn't have running water, uh, he, 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 he grew all his food, uh, walked barefoot both, mostly all year round, and he was the happiest person in the world. And when, he, and when the interviewer asked him, are you a happy person? I said, I sure am. I have my Bible, I have my Lord, and the Lord provides me with everything. I said, you know, I want to go there and, and be his neighbor. <laughs> yeah. Doesn't have a word in the world. The world could just fall apart and he'd be there just eating his potatoes and his greens, maybe killing a pig or two, preparing for the winter. But the Lord says, you need to pray for hope. When you look at the world, you lose your hope. But when you look at the Lord, you gain hope because you know that He's in control of everything. We need to pray for each other. You know, sometimes I see people in the church that kind of lost hope. They're going through a depression. They're trying to give comfort to a couple lately who seem to be down the dumps, as they say. Um, I've met believers who consider committing suicide. I think like, how can that be? They're, they are born again believers and they're thinking this way. I wonder what's going through the minds. You know, I think we have a duty towards our brothers and sisters who have lost hope. And Paul says, my eyes are constantly looking towards you so that you don't lose hope. This is what he says in Ephesians 1.18. Having my eyes uh, of your heart, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? Romans 15, 13, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing. You know, hope, and remember, he was trying to encourage believers while he was in prison. This is the biggest thing, the, the thing that just puzzles me. He's not in... The, in some uh, beautiful Caribbean island with some uh, pineapple juice and uh, just underneath a, a shade saying, uh, I, I'm so joyful, uh, I, am, I am so thankful uh, for the Lord, what He's doing in my life. He's in, in prison and He's encouraging others while He's in this situation. You pray that they will live in peace and unity. Romans 15, 5 and 6 may the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Jesus Christ that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, pray that they would be strengthened spiritually. I'm not going to 
read all the verses that, you know, there's just page after page. When you see this, you think, maybe, I'm, you know, when we have our prayer meeting, we're missing something. Maybe we're focusing the wrong way. Sometimes we need to be reminded that what, why the church is here. Anybody know why the church is here? We're here to be a light to, the, uh, to a lost world, to preach the gospel. But how many times do we hear uh, people say, you know, I have this burden for my neighbor. I really want an open door. I, I've been trying to reach this person with the gospel. But, but you know, so many things get in the way. And there's so, many, so much interference. The, the devil is not allowing this to happen. Uh, would you please pray for Pepe or for Antonio or for this a co-worker, you know, we don't we don't see that compassion very often, and we need and that that needs to be there. Maybe we just need to pray for each other that the compassion of the Lord Jesus Christ will actually fill us, so that we will have compassion <laughs> for growth in the love of others, for righteousness and purity. Uh, he prayed for. Um, uh, that they would overflow with praise and thanks to God. Anybody have any testimony? Everybody would be raising their hands. I have so many blessings. Oh, I, I lost my job yesterday. Oh, uh, uh, my wife, they uh, detected uh, an illness, but I thank the Lord anyway, because I know the Lord is in control. You know, they were ready to thank God no matter what situation they were in. Folks, I think maybe we need to focus better. They pray for opportunities to minister. How many of us are praying, Lord, give me an opportunity to minister? If it's not in the church because most of the positions are covered, maybe outside, maybe I can a, a, a volunteer in something, helping somebody, a neighbor. Lord, I want to be, I want to minister to you. I, I, put me in a place where I can be needed, that I can show the love of Christ. We're not praying that way. We need to pray for our enemies. How many of you are good at praying for your enemies? Oh, I have a party every time uh, the enemies come along. <laughs> oh Lord, I love praying for my enemies. No, yeah, I, like, I like praying for my enemies that some lightning will hit them. <laughs> no. Pray that they will see. Remember how the Lord prayed for his enemies while they were crucifying him? Lord, forgive them. For they know not what they're doing. Remember Stephen? Lord, forgive them. For they do not know what they're doing, even while they were stunning him. How about poor sick believers? We see that in James chapter 5, verse 6, uh, verse 16. And then for all men, you say, well, Pastor, if I do this, I'll be spending all day praying. Well, maybe that's a good idea. No. But the one that catches my attention most is something that the prophet Samuel said about prayer. He said that it would be sinful for him not to pray for his people. Sinful. Not to, this is how he puts it in 1 Samuel 12 and 23. Moreover, as for me, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. That in ceasing, I, I, don't, want to, I don't want to sin against God by not praying for you. You might not think that that way about not praying, but Samuel certainly did. I have a responsibility to guard you, to guard, to guard for you, guard for you. And so I, 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 would, I want to do my part. I want to be there for you. I want to pray for you. You know, sometimes we are ready to criticize others for what they do and not ready enough to pray for them. We see some fault. In their, cho in their choices and their lifestyle. And when we're with somebody, we just kind of uh, start throwing stones at them. You know, instead of saying, you know what, um, they need our prayer. Somebody said one time that the only army that shoots the wounded is the Christian army. That's pretty hard to hear. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 2, it says, Bear ye one another's burdens and fulfill. And so fulfill the law of Christ. The law of Christ is, do you have any burdens that I can carry for you, that I can help you through? You might say, well, you know, you can't carry my burdens, but at least I can pray for you. 
Make people understand. If you say, you know, if you have any burdens, let me know. I'd like to pray for you. Next time you meet with them, say, you know what, I'm praying for you. How is that burden along? And then you know, they'll be confident when they hear you say, it's still there, but you know, it feels so much better to know that somebody's behind me. Somebody standing behind me. Somebody that really cares. It comforts me. So what do we need to do? Pray unselfishly. Showing unselfish concern for the welfare of others. Second, pray with empathy. That is, understanding the, and entering into another's feelings. If you go back to Colossians chapter 4, notice again verse 2, it says, Continuing prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. But now you move over to verse 3, and notice what it says, with, without praying also for us. Paul, you need prayer? In what condition, what situation are you? From where did Paul write this letter? Anybody know? Paul wrote four prison epistles. Colossians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Philemon. All from prison. And he's saying here, hey guys, I'm praying for you. Would you care to pray for me? Okay, Paul, what, what condition are you in? I'm in bonds. I'm in prison. Pray also for us. But notice that he's not asking to be released from prison, but that he has open doors to, uh, to, to preach the gospel, to reveal, to, give, to utter the message of salvation properly. Pray also for us, he says there, for his co-workers there in prison. Pray with empathy, trying to get them to put themselves in the shoes they are in. You remember, uh, you, you remember Don John, brother John McCarty, I mean, uh, Roger McCarty, mm -hmm. pastor of First Community uh, uh, Church in Los Gatos, California. He used to come, he says, he writes to me, he says, I miss going to Spain. I miss, I miss you, you, you guys so, um, uh, so much. Last time I went to their church to, make, to report, I walked in the door and people in the church said, Hey, Brother Sammy, how are you doing? I haven't seen these people for six years. Brother Sammy, oh, how is Brother John Birch? He said, well, he's just, you know, it's, it's, it's doing good. Praise the Lord. You know, a little bit here, getting a little older, but he's still, he's still fighting for the Lord. And how is, how is Diana? And then how is Carol? He remembers those in the English group because he had more um, interaction with them. <laughs> and he says, what about Pippi? What about Juan? He says, I, I miss those dear brothers. You know, things changed for him when he came down here. He could put faces to his prayer. And he could communicate this to his people. And his people in the church would come to me and say, we are so thankful that we can send Brother McCarty over to you. I said, why? Because I take him around and get him to feed him well? He says, no, because he changes. He comes back differently. There's something about getting to know those people that the church supports, know them personally, intimately, that makes the pastor come back and say, brothers, you know that person over there that we support? That person is real. That's true of flesh and blood. And they're going through trials. We don't know, let's make sure that we don't just send a support to them, financial support. We need to be staying behind them with our prayers. Constantly, Roger McCarty is one of those pastors that every time I write a message to him, he responds. You have any of those, Brother Tim? It is amazing how, you know, in a busy schedule, because these, some of these churches that these pastors uh, pastor are probably three, four hundred people with dozens of ministries with a, a co-pastor with a, 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 a youth pastor you know they have their schedule is fully loaded but then they have enough time to say brother sammy i love you i remember you i pray for you and i really would like to be with you back you know this I want to, i'm praying that the lord will have me come back and you know be able to connect with the brothers to see what they're going to Brother, Brother Woody would have the same urge. He writes to me every single week, sends me a prayer, and then invites me to uh, connect with the with a, um, an internet connection uh, to pray with others from around the world. You know, I don't know about you, but when I get and they, and they pray 
with name and everything. I pray for Brother Sammy and Melissa. That Brother Sammy doesn't kill Melissa. So. <laughs> no, 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 no. That you know that, that that their love in their marriages grows stronger. That uh, whatever situation that, that is specifically for things they know that we're going through. And so you say, how do they know? Because they're going through it. They pray, they're praying with empathy. They, they put themselves in your. You know, this is the way we need to pray. Because pastors, preachers have study schedules. They we need to pray for them while they study. They have ministry duties. They have burdens. Well, we don't have burdens, Brother Tim, do we? No. What do we do with the burdens? We do the same as ducks when water just rolls on, you know, they just, we just shake them away. No, we have burdens. And so I'm talking sometimes you don't find very many people say, Pastor. Is there anything really special that I can pray for you for? I mean, I really mean it. I really, I'm really interested. I really want to be, I want to, I be mean, my longer, like they say in Spain. I want to, you know, bring my shoulder so you can lean on it. <clears throat> pray for wisdom. Pray for God's enlightenment as he studies. Um, pray so that they will know how to apply biblical truth, how to express biblical truth. And pray for their congregations, for the things that might be going through. Pray for encouragement, for the devil's attacks. Uh, that we need to pray. And then when you think about missionaries, try to put yourself in their shoes. Go over there to Romania. You know, we did a mission trip to Romania. What would happen? We would try to start praying for Romania with a different different attitude. We wouldn't just be talking about Brother Prikov sending uh, you know, aid to Ukraine and to the, and to the gypsies that uh, he has there. He, we would say, hey, you know, we, how's your wife? How's your kids? How's some so? Remember, we ate at his place and it was so open, so loving towards us. We would have a different spirit. Pray for their culture. Pray for their home. For their family, for maybe isolation, maybe they're having problems as they try to share the gospel. Pray for language barriers. Brother Prikov lives in, um, well, he kind of ministers both in Romania and uh, what's the other place? Hungary. Hungary. And then he goes to um, Ukraine. Ukraine. Imagine the language barriers that he has to face. And, it doesn't seem to be a, a barrier for him because his heart is all over the situation. He prayed for financial needs, pray for evangelism opportunities, pray, pray for their preaching. What about their wives? Do we pray for their wives? Do they, they don't have any needs. You know, sometimes we neglect praying for the wives of the pastor or the missionary. You know, they carry a tremendous weight. They have to see their husbands sometimes trying to figure out what to do in a desperate situation. They need comforting. They need support. They're always there for their husband and for the church, but who's there for them? See what I mean? Be concerned. Pray with empathy. Put yourself in their shoes. Before you criticize something for somebody for what they're doing, make sure you understand what they're going through. This is so important. Pray for their attendance, that the Lord will bring visitors into the church. Pray for their concerns. <clears throat> and thirdly, we need to pray fervently, yes. We need to pray specifically, yes. In addition, we need to pray unselfishly and with empathy. For who? For others, for the pastor, for the missionary, for church attendees. But notice the third one. Pray evangelistically, that is, with a burden for the spread of the gospel. How many of you truly have a burden to share the gospel with others around you? I see JJ sometimes who sits at the cafe, uh, orders a, ca a, a coffee, and he has his little contractual over the table. I had I, my hat uh, off of you, brother JJ, for one to do that. Anybody that sits uh, with him is you know, hoping that maybe they will ask a question or two, he's not going to push it. I'm not, I'm not putting him as an example, but that we, we should be willing to do the same thing. We pray evangelistically that we would have a burden. Years ago, I was in Aviano, Italy. 
In a church there, it was a military church, a church of American military, the church supported us. One year, that when I passed through, I preached on compassion for the lost. I just went on and on and on with compassion. Somehow the Lord used that message, and one of the soldiers approached me with burden and said, Pastor Sammy, I don't know, I don't have enough compassion. I say this with shame. With a, what, what can I do to have compassion? And of course, I wanted to be fast and look smart and try to give him an answer. I said, pray for it. I didn't say it with that tone. But that's what came out of my mouth. But somehow when I went home, I said, somehow that, that's, that's not enough. I came uh, back about two or three years later, I can't remember. The same guy was there. And I told them, I said, you know, remember when you asked me that question? What do you need to do to have compassion? I told you, pray. He said, yeah. I said, you need to do more than pray. You need to get out there and put yourself in place where compassion is needed. Don't just pray. Get off your seat. Get out of your, out of your comfort zone. Move around. Get to meet people. Have a life out there, social life. Not get mingled in their sin, but try to connect with people, see how they hurt, see what they need. This is what Paul was praying for, for an open door to speak the gospel. Lord, give me an open door. And those who are, those doors that are half open, give me boldness to open them completely so I can share the message with them. Hey folks, he says to the church in Colossae, hey, pray and then God will, I'm praying for you. And you pray for me. Not necessarily for this jail door to open, or this prison door to open, but that God might open an opportunity to reach those around me, those the guards, those Roman guards, you know, the you know, square jawed Roman soldiers. They don't need the gospel. They would not need the gospel. Remote, remember Cornelius? He was a centurion. He was in charge of a hundred soldiers. I can imagine him when Paul and when Peter entered his door, but this man was a tender-hearted person seeking to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter didn't want to be there. The Lord had to convince him through some visions. Remember the the Las Lona, the, uh, the three times that he, um, you remember that, hard for me to express it in English. It took more convincing to get Peter to get to Cornelius than to Cornelius to hear the gospel. When Peter got there and opened his mouth, very unwilling, I believe, because this was a Roman soldier, this was a dog in the mind of a Jew. They don't want, Jews did not want anything to do with, uh, with the Romans, with Gentiles, especially with a Roman soldier who was in charge of a hundred so Roman soldiers. But this man was tender-hearted, he was open. You know, you might think that people out there who just seem like really hard out there, they're unapproachable, they're impossible to reach. Uh, they're closed-minded. Well, let's pray that the Lord will break those barriers. <clears throat> Spain is, you know, Brother Tim, uh, I got this information for a veteran missionary back in Madrid, um, uh, uh, Martin Robertson. He's retired now. He spent over 30 years as a missionary in Spain. But he got an article where it said that Spain is the least Spanish-speaking evangelized country in the world. Coming as a missionary to Spain is like plowing on cement for the first 10, 15 years. Very little fruit. You think Spain needs missionaries? We need missionaries, of course, but we need people who pray for those missionaries who stick with it, no matter what. <clears throat> There's so much more I could say about, you know, reaching. Here, let me share with you this. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 13, it says that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in, other, in all other places. Now, I went to the dictionary, to the, uh, 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 a word study dictionary, and the word there for palace, it said this. The Praetorian camp at Rome, meaning the camp of, uh, or quarters of the Praetorian cohorts, Praetorian bodyguard, the elite Roman force. These were a body of select troops instituted by Augustus to guard him and to have 
charge over the city. And he's saying, oh, uh, be praying for those two. I'm going to pray for those guys. He said, no, they, they need your prayers. And by the way, um, he says, and uh, uh, he says, I send greetings to the believers in Caesar's household. So every saint in Jesus Christ, the brethren which are with me, greet all the saints, all the saints salute you, chiefly they that are of Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord uh, Jesus Christ be with all of you. Caesar's household. You mean that some of the servants in Caesar's house came to Christ? Maybe it was through one of the one of the guards. I don't know. I need to study this a little deeper. But it's interesting that he would mention even those in a situation like that. In Ephesians 6, I'm almost finished. In chapter 6, verses 9 and through 20, it says, And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in bonds. I don't have freedom, but boy, I want freedom to open my mouth. <clears throat> Ephesians, I think it's, uh, no, first, first Timothy, I think it is chapter 2. Uh, he says, uh, I'm in bonds, but the gospel is not in bonds. And I'm so happy about it. Probably can see the day very soon that he's going to be um, slaughtered, killed. But he says, you know, I am the freer now than ever before. All my other brother, brethren have abandoned me, but the Lord stayed with me. I am free. And my, my desire, even at this moment, at the end of my life, is that the Lord will still continue to give me opportunities to preach the message. You know, we all face human hindrances to witness. But the Lord says, simple, pray. Pray evangelistically is praying for the spread of the gospel. If Paul needed an open door, he would say, please, as the Lord open it, make sure that you keep praying for me so that I, wherever I go, the Lord will keep opening opportunities. Opportunities to open up, hearts to open up, for boldness to push open doors that are not fully shut. We must pray that God will lead us to people who will listen. We need to pray for opportunities, and we need to pray for um, bravery, we need to pray for boldness to speak. And that when we open our mouth, we have a clear message. Now this will require doing some rehearsal, having some method, uh, using some illustrations. It's always important when you give the message, you know, people don't understand this. Remember, you call it the mystery of the gospel. People, although for you and for me, this is a very simple thing. That Jesus Christ is the Savior, and he has a free gift of salvation. If we only come to him with repentance and faith, it's very simple. But to the people out there, this is a mystery. How are we going to explain something that flies over their head? We pray. We rehearse it. We we use terminology that they can understand. We um, uh, try to use illustrations that, uh, you know, everyday illustrations. The Lord Jesus Christ did, did this all the time. He would use the, 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 uh, the fields, the, the plants, the trees. He would use every situation around them to make very complicated things simple to understand. We need to do that too. We need to be able to speak in a way that people say, oh, I understand that. Years ago, I, I had a chance to, uh, to share the gospel with an engineer. His mind was all squares and numbers. And he said, you know, I've been listening to people talking about the gospel, the gospel, the gospel, so I've never understood any of that. And I have, I have plenty of people explain that, to try to explain that to me. One day I got a piece of paper, a pen, and I uh, got a few verses, and I tried, I drew it out. And I, I, I walked him through these, this drawing and every word in the passage. And he finally said, I understand now. I said, so what do you, you want to do with this now that you understand? He says, I'm ready. 
and I led him to the Lord. He was hope. He, he didn't have a, a close heart. He just had a close understanding. He didn't understand. He needed somebody to be able to make it clear to them. How would we make the gospel clear to somebody? I've heard some folks try to share the gospel, and I was more confused after they shared it than before they started sharing it. They really didn't understand how to, you know, bring it across. And I think this is important that we do it, that we understand how it works, and we understand how to explain it. So folks, to bring, bring this message to a close, we need to pray for ourselves. Amen? Amen. But we need also to pray for others. We need to have empathy. We need to pray unselfishly, showing uh, unselfish concern for the welfare of others with empathy, understanding, and entering into each other's feelings, and evangelistically with a burden for the spread of the gospel. Pray, pray for open doors. Pray for boldness. So that you don't chicken away from the opportunity, that you walk straight in and you share the message. <clears throat> there was one time I was sharing the message with a friend over a cup of coffee in a restaurant and I wasn't aware that there's people behind me and in front of me listening and of course I was, I was it was pretty much like Paul and Silas in Ephesus when he was uh, singing you know the guard was back there listening I'm sure some of the songs that they were singing had the gospel in, in the message because very shortly after the earthquake, the guard came in and said, What do we need to do to get saved? You know, came in straight away with that big question. Well, I was in that restaurant, I was explaining, guess who was really capturing it? The person behind me. And uh, I didn't know. And before we left, this individual in front of me didn't, didn't, didn't budge at all, but the people around me, which was several people, heard the message, and one of them said, I know, I, I, nobody had ever explained that to me that way. Not to me, but you know, to the person in front of me. They were picking up on it. I've had situations where, you know, you, you pray over your, over your meal in a restaurant, and somebody's watching. I've seen men, uh, believers sometimes when they have to pray in a restaurant go, Let's pray with that. Hopefully, hopefully nobody will see us. No, let, it, let everybody see it. This waitress one time said, Are you Christian? I said, What do you ask? He says, You pray over your lunch. We don't see that happen very often. Now, that's very interesting to me. And it opened up a conversation. There's a place over here in Los Arcos, about 20 kilometers, it's kind of a hidden place where Melissa and I, are, you know, when we just want to get out of way from, I'm not going to tell you where it is because I don't want to come into the house. But very often, that the waitress would sit there with us, forgetting other um, uh, clients, only to hear about this. Not because of, because I was sympathetic, but because my is so open. She just, as I said, she opens the door for me, and when she opens the door for me, I just walk in. There's many situations that we come across. Let's, let's make sure that we pray for ourselves and for others. But especially, let's pray for those missionaries. Pray for them by name. Try to learn the name of their wife, and the wife of each one of these missionaries, their kids, what they're going through. You know, some missionary kids uh, have, have to go through tremendous burdens. And uh, we don't pray for them enough. We should pray for them. And you know when you when you pray for these individuals, once they walk in the door, maybe for a missions conference, then you can start asking, how's your wife? Da da da, the name, and your son, and your mother and grandmother, and, and all those people that they asked us to pray for. If you don't have enough time, if you think a one hour prayer is too long, when you put a, put a list like this in front of you, you would need not one hour, you would need several hours. Every 